Okay, so let me see. I did a video about the Notable Klingons in Classic Trek. I did one about the Notable Klingons in TNG and Deep Space Nine and Voyager and Enterprise. No Notable Klingons to date on Prodigy, but there have been a few Klingons worth mentioning on Discovery and Strange New Worlds and... <sighs> lower decks, but those are all still relatively new, so I'll let them breathe for a bit. Which means the only Klingons left to inventory are the ones in the movies! And children, let me tell you, if you've never seen a Star Trek film with Klingons in it in an actual movie theater, you are missing out. You cannot fully appreciate Klingons until you have experienced them on the big screen as God intended. This is cinema. The obvious place to start when talking about Star Trek movies is the first Star Trek movie, which is actually called Star Trek the Motion Picture, not Star Trek the Movie, because I guess Gene Roddenberry thought that was a more serious, highbrow title for a Star Trek movie. And it just so happens there are Klingons in the movie, right near the beginning, in fact. They don't do anything other than die, but that doesn't mean they aren't important. The Klingons in Star Trek the Motion Picture accomplish two important things. First, and most importantly, they establish the threat of V'ger, the squadron of Klingon ships that encounters the cloud surrounding V'ger in the film's first scene. The unnamed Klingon captain, played by Mark Leonard, best known for originating the role of Spock's father, Ambassador Sarek, orders his crew to shoot torpedoes at the cloud. That doesn't work, and the cloud shoots lightning at the Klingon ships, which disintegrates them. So, right away, we get that this thing is dangerous. We don't know what it is yet, or what it's called, or where it comes from, but we know it's impervious to attack, it's powerful, and it's capable of destroying a squadron of Klingon ships with no trouble at all. This thing is big bad news. It just redshirted a bunch of Klingons. How is Captain Kirk going to stop it? Second, their appearance lets us know that Klingons look like this now. This is the debut of the character design that Klingons have had, generally speaking, with some adjustments here and there through the years ever since. Sharp teeth, facial hair, foreheads with bumps or ridges, costumes that look like some kind of chest armor. Klingons! Was there any in-story explanation for why these Klingons look so different from the ones we see in Star Trek the original series? No! Because this movie was made by people who assumed most people who watched it would understand that they were watching a work of fiction, not a documentary. Fucking Thermians were not the target audience. Other than some Klingon ships we see as part of the Kobayashi Maru simulation, a reused shot from Star Trek The Motion Picture, there are no Klingons in Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, but the Klingons return with a vengeance in the next film in the series, Star Trek III, The Search for Spock, when we meet the first great Klingon villain of the TOS movie era, Commander Krug. Brought to life by Christopher Lloyd, whose performance is as underrated as the rest of this very good movie, Krug is as classic a pulp adventure villain as we ever see in a Star Trek movie. He doesn't have the personal history with Kirk that Khan has in Star Trek II, nor the erudite charm of General Chang in Star Trek VI, but he does have two essential qualities for an antagonist of his type, ambition and ruthlessness. Krug isn't the only Klingon worth mentioning in Star Trek III. There's also Valkris. Don't get attached. He blows her up in his first scene for knowing too much, but it's amicable. And there's Maltz, an officer aboard Krug's ship, played by John Larroquette, who is almost as unrecognizable as that character as Mark Leonard is in the first movie. Maltz's role in the movie consists mostly of listening to and agreeing with Krug and not being killed by Kirk when the Starfleet guys take over Krug's ship. But when I see Maltz, I always think of the Klingon dictionary. Star Trek III is not the first time we hear Klingons speaking the Klingon language instead of English. The Klingons in Star Trek The Motion Picture also speak it, but for the few lines of Klingon in the motion picture, they kind of just made some stuff up. James Doohan helped out with that. We hear a lot more Klingons spoken in Star Trek III, so they hired linguist Mark Okrand to come up with something more elaborate. Seems a little silly to me to go through all that trouble. 
Just decide how you want spoken Klingon to sound and make some shit up on the set for the actors to say, who gives a fuck? But it turned into a decent gig for Mark Okren, so good for him. A few years after Star Trek III came out, Okrand published the first edition of the Klingon Dictionary and wrote an in-story introduction where he credits Maltz with teaching him the basics of the Klingon language. I'm sure language tutor isn't the second career most Klingon warriors dream of, but hopefully Maltz made the best of it. You know, I got a copy of the updated edition of the Klingon Dictionary when I was about 13 or 14, and in hindsight, that was a pretty significant branching point for my relationship to Star Trek, because I paged through the book, lost interest almost immediately, and realized, you know what? I'm not this kind of fan. The kind that learns to speak the fake language and does cosplay just for the sake of it and all that stuff. Not that there's anything wrong with that. If you're that type of fan, go forth and be happy with my best wishes, but that's not me. And the Klingon Dictionary helped me to figure that out. Thanks, Maltz. Now back to Krug. Early on in Star Trek III, Krug learns of the Genesis device and immediately realizes that its power is just as destructive as it is creative, and that with such a weapon in its hands, his hands, the Klingon Empire would be unstoppable. So, Krug heads to the Genesis planet, where Dr. David Marcus and Lieutenant Savick have just beamed down from the Starfleet science vessel Grissom to investigate an unusual life sign that turns out to be the resurrected Spock. Krug's ship destroys the Grissom, and then Krug kills his overzealous gunner for doing it. He didn't want the ship destroyed. He wanted to capture the crew and interrogate them to learn what they knew about Genesis. Luckily, David and Savick and Spock are still down on the planet, so Krug sends some of his men down to capture them. They do. Then Kirk and the gang show up aboard the Enterprise. After a brief battle that leaves the Enterprise mostly disabled, Krug decides to show Kirk that he means business by executing one of the hostages on the planet. As fate would have it, the hostage who gets executed is David, Kirk's son. Well, now it's personal. Kirk sets the Enterprise's self-destruct mechanism, lures Krug's crew over to capture the Enterprise, and beams down to the planet with McCoy, Scotty, Sulu, and Chekhov. The Klingons beam in, just in time to be blown up real good along with the Enterprise. Krug is upset about that, but you know what? That's what happens when you kill Captain Kirk's son. Krug beams down to the planet, which is unstable and has begun tearing itself apart with randomly shifting gravitational and geological forces. Krug has everyone beamed up to his ship as prisoners, except for Kirk and the revived but mentally blank Spock. This leads to one of my favorite lines in the movie, when Kirk tells Krug, you should beam up the Vulcan too. Krug says, no. Kirk asks, why not? And Krug spits back, because you wish it. I love it when a bad guy is willing to just be a petty asshole. Anyway, Kirk and Krug fight. Kirk gives Krug the most iconic villain death in all of Star Trek by declaring, I have had enough of you, and kicking him off the edge of a cliff. Then grabs Spock and beams up to the Klingon ship where his people have taken control. The movie goes on as they head to Vulcan to get Spock's soul reinstalled, but that's the end of Krug. Not a bad record, really. He loses, of course. The villains always lose, but Krug gets his shots in. He blows up the Grissom, he's responsible for the murder of the hero's son, and he's indirectly responsible for the destruction of the hero's ship, a loss that packs almost as much of an emotional punch as the death of Spock in the previous film. Plus, Krug establishes a template for Klingon villains to follow. He is a rogue commander, a warrior thirsty for battle, who believes the Klingon Empire has grown soft and passive, too concerned with making peace with the Federation. His plan is to capture an ultimate weapon and use it to return his nation to its glory days of war and conquest. And if that sounds familiar, it's because almost every Klingon villain after Krug in the movies and on TV has basically the same plan. I will return the Empire to its former glory, because it works so well for the last guy who tried it, right? One of the few exceptions to this pattern is actually the next Klingon of note in the Star Trek film series, Captain Claw, a secondary antagonist in Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. Like Krug, Claw is disillusioned with the general lack of opportunities to blow shit up and kill people available to him nowadays, but Claw's ambition lacks the scope of Krug's. 
Whereas Krug hopes to use the Genesis device to enable the Klingon Empire to dominate the Federation, Claw is just after personal glory. He's young and ambitious, and when he learns that Captain Kirk's taking the Enterprise to Nimbus 3 to deal with a hostage crisis, he sees an opportunity to prove himself by challenging and defeating Starfleet's most formidable warrior. Claw is one of the most impressively unimpressive adversaries Kirk and his crew ever face, but it's not really Claw's fault. He's not the primary villain of the story. That would be Cybok. And he spends most of the movie literally chasing after Kirk while Kirk is dealing with more pressing matters. Claw's function in the story is mostly to catch up to the Enterprise when it's time for an action scene. He doesn't even get the glory of being killed by Captain Kirk, poor guy. Claw's ship attacks the Enterprise while Kirk is stuck on the planet where the false god entity lives. Claw disables the Enterprise and demands Kirk as a prisoner in exchange for the lives of the rest of his crew. Instead, Claw is contacted by General Kord, the washed-up old Klingon ambassador who joined Cybok's cult on Nimbus 3, who orders Claw to stand down and apologize to Kirk for attacking him, which Claw does. Can you imagine anything more humiliating for a Klingon warrior? Shit, one time Worf almost stabbed himself after not being able to dream for like a week. What's Claw gonna do when he gets home? Throw himself into a fucking volcano? He puts on a good face at that mixer on the Enterprise at the end of the movie, but you can tell he's basically dead inside. Claude doesn't even get a character arc, unless you count going from a brash and reckless young troublemaker to someone who says he's sorry to Kirk in a tone not unlike that of a child apologizing for pulling someone's pigtails on the playground. Cord, the old general, gets more character development than Claw does. He starts out as a drunk, out of shape has been, but then he gets a stern talking to from Spock, which inspires him to take charge and jerk that young whippersnapper Claw back in line. It's not much of an arc, but it's something. Of course, both Claw and Cord get more to work with than the other notable Klingon in Star Trek V, Vixis. Claw's... First officer, I guess? And also maybe his girlfriend? I don't know. She has one line in English, a few lines in Klingon, and the only reason we even know her name is because it's in the end credits. Her most memorable moment comes during that mixer aboard the Enterprise at the end, when she provides the setup for a gag with Sulu and Chekhov, who look like they're about to invite her to a three-way until they see her going to stand next to Claw, at which point they turn on their heels and shuffle off in another direction. Two bad guys, but if it's any consolation, she would definitely have killed you both. Next up is Star Trek VI, and when we're talking about Klingons in Star Trek movies, this one is the mother load. Interesting Klingon characters who play important roles in the story. A story which is about that most classic of all Star Trek conflicts, Starfleet versus Klingons. The most important Klingon character in the film is General Chang, but I've talked about him a lot in previous videos, so I don't want to repeat myself too extensively here. The short version is, he's awesome, he's one of my favorite villains in the entire franchise, he's cultured, he's theatrical, he's played by Christopher Plummer, he's the greatest, and I love him, but there are other Klingons in the movie, quite a few, in fact. There's Chancellor Gorkon, the Klingon Abe Lincoln, played by the great David Warner. In many ways, he is what we've come to expect from a Klingon by this point. Imposing, intimidating, authoritative, formidable. But Gorkon is atypical of his people in some important ways. He's reserved. He's not a lusty, aggressive pirate or a scenery-chewing melodrama villain. He's not trying to impress anyone. He simply is impressive. He's intelligent and educated, but he doesn't display it the way General Chang does. Gorkin is quiet, thoughtful, a man of few words. That thoughtfulness goes beyond his manner and also touches his motivations. Unlike most other Klingons, including most of the ones in Star Trek VI, Gorkin seems genuinely interested in making peace with the Federation, not because he's weak or naive as his enemies and rivals seem to think, but because he has the vision to see that his people cannot continue to survive in a state of perpetual conflict, particularly in the aftermath of the Praxis disaster. 
It's a very un-Klingon way of looking at things, which is one reason why Starfleet, and specifically Spock, are so motivated to support Gorkin's peacemaking efforts. Spock warns the assembled officers during their meeting at Starfleet headquarters near the start of the film that if they don't work with Gorkin to forge a strong peace between their two governments, there are plenty of Klingons willing to push Gorkin aside and go out in a blaze of glory. The third notable Klingon in Star Trek VI is Azitbor. Gorkin's daughter, who becomes Chancellor following his assassination. She stands in between her father, the dignified, forward-looking peacemaker, and General Chang, the flamboyant, militant opponent of peace. As it were, seems supportive of what her father wants to do, but during the dinner aboard the Enterprise, she displays her aversion to humans and their cultural biases. When Chekhov, trying to sound tolerant and welcoming to their Klingon guests, declares that the Federation believes everyone is entitled to inalienable human rights, it is Azitbor who points out the inherent prejudice of the language. If you could only hear yourselves, she says, inalienable human rights. Her father getting murdered by members of Starfleet probably doesn't improve her attitude as far as that goes, but she does continue with the peace process. She doesn't seem as ideologically committed to it as Gorkin. She appears to view it more as a necessity than anything else, given the grim future the Klingon homeworld faces following the explosion of Praxis, but she keeps it going. And from the bits we're able to hear of her speech to the peace conference at the end of the film, it seems clear that Ozitbor, despite her misgivings, is not the go-out-in-a-blaze-of-glory type. She tells the conference, we are a proud people, and we wish to go on being proud. Chang, Gorkin, and Azitbor are the three most important Klingon characters in Star Trek VI, but there are others. There's Kurla, Gorkin's military advisor, who also attends the dinner aboard the Enterprise. There's Colonel Worf, Kirk and McCoy's defense attorney, during their trial. Hey, he looks familiar. There's the judge at the trial, played by Robert Easton, who my fellow lovers of Mystery Science Theater 3000 will recognize as one of the stars of the giant spider invasion. Yes, that's him, as would-be Diamond Baron and eventual spider food Dan Kester. There's the warden of the Rurapente Penal Colony, played by W. Morgan Shepard, always a welcome presence in a film or TV show. There's the Klingon ambassador, played by the equally welcome John Shuck, who, despite appearing in Star Trek IV as well as Star Trek VI, is never actually given a name. In the novels, he's named Camarag, so I guess we'll go with that. In Star Trek IV, Shuck's character's big moment is when he declares to the Federation Council, there shall be no peace as long as Kirk lives. But by the end of Star Trek VI, when Kirk has foiled the conspiracy to destroy the peace conference and cleared his name of the assassination of Gorkin, we see the ambassador applauding with the others like, okay, fine, I guess we can have peace even though Kirk lives, but don't ask me for anything else. Overall, as a group, the Klingons in Star Trek VI just have a different vibe that I really dig. They aren't all as witty and well-read as General Chang, or as statesmanlike as Chancellor Gorkin, but, some questionable table manners aside, they aren't the space-faring cavemen snarling and headbutting each other for fun that they're typically shown to be in the TNG era TV shows either. They come across like Klingons from Star Trek the original series. John Colicos, William Campbell, Michael Ansara type Klingons with the more elaborate movie era makeup and character design. That works very well. It's appropriate to the occasion to have Klingons that evoke the classic series, since Star Trek VI is the swan song for the original cast, and it adds some complexity to Kirk's characterization in the film. He stubbornly declares to Spock early on that the Klingons are animals. Then we meet some of the least animalistic Klingons we've ever seen, which subtly underlines the depth of Kirk's bigotry. Bigotry which he is forced to confront as a part of his character arc. Speaking of Klingons who play an important role in the story and the development of the main characters, let's talk about the opposite of that, the Duras sisters in Star Trek Generations. The Duras sisters, Lursa and Bator, are memorable but relatively minor recurring antagonists from Star Trek The Next Generation. 
Outside of TNG, they pop up in one episode of Deep Space Nine, and then here in Generations, the first movie centered on the TNG crew. Neither that Deep Space Nine appearance nor their presence in Generations is especially noteworthy or necessary. In Generations, they're essentially functioning as goons for Dr. Sorin, with some vague notion of using a trilithium weapon Sorin has developed to reconquer the Klingon Empire. Yawn. They capture Geordi and hack his visor so that when they return him to the Enterprise, they can sneak a look at the shield frequency and have that advantage when they attack, but it doesn't do them much good in the long run, and the Enterprise blows up their bird of prey without too much trouble, and that's the end of the Duras sisters. It's a pretty anticlimactic end, even for a couple of B-grade antagonists. Bator doesn't even try to seduce anyone. My god, what is even the point? As disappointing as the handling of Lursa and Bator is in Generations, it's not that much worse than how they do My Man Worf in the TNG movies. Granted, the TNG movies do a poor job of utilizing everyone in the ensemble beyond Picard and Data, so it's not like Worf is alone in being poorly treated in the movies, but this video is about Klingons, and I'm talking about the Klingon guy! Worf gets promoted to Lieutenant Commander in Generations. It means absolutely nothing, and he does a little else of note in the film. Worf is actually treated very well in First Contact. It's the best of the TNG movies, and it's the best use of Worf in the movies. Worf is a regular on Deep Space Nine by this point, and the script finds a way of bringing him back into the fold with the rest of his Enterprise crewmates that doesn't feel too contrived. He's in command of the Defiant, and participating in the attack on the Borg cube that's approaching Earth at the start of the film. Okay, that makes sense. If you've seen Deep Space Nine, you know that the Defiant was originally designed to fight the Borg, so its presence at the battle is reasonable. And even if you've never seen Deep Space Nine and don't give a shit about anything that happens in it, the Borg attack on Earth is kind of a big deal an all-hands-on-deck type situation, so again, Worf and the Defiant being there feels reasonable. The Defiant is damaged in the battle, Picard has its crew beamed aboard the Enterprise, and there you go! Worf is back on the team. Nicely done. After his reintroduction, Worf actually gets some meaningful stuff to do in First Contact. He takes part in the spacewalk scene alongside Picard and Lieutenant Redshirt to stop the Borg from modifying the Enterprise's deflector dish to call in reinforcements. It's a cool scene all around, and not only does Worf get to take part in it, he gets his own little story. He fights a Borg, gets his spacesuit ripped open, it looks like he's done for, then he comes back at the end in the nick of time, the torn leg of his spacesuit tied off with a cable from one of the Borg he hacked to pieces. And then, when the deflector dish has been disconnected from the ship and floats away, Worf gets the big action hero moment, dropping a witty yet cold-blooded one-liner, assimilate this, and blowing up the dish and all the Borg attached to it. That's some good Worfin! And as if that wasn't enough, he also gets a fantastic scene with Captain Picard later on, when the Borg have overrun the ship, and everyone except the revenge-driven Picard is saying they need to evacuate and destroy the Enterprise to eliminate the Borg. Worf challenges Picard, tells him his emotions are clouding his judgment. Picard steps way out of line by accusing Worf of wanting to run away because he's a coward, and Worf steps up in Picard's face like, if you were any other man, I would kill you where you stand. Then, a few minutes later, after he's been talked down by Lily, Picard comes back to Worf like, hey man, I'm sorry, you're not a coward, you're awesome. And Worf's like, I know, thank you, but for everybody's sake, you really need to quit fucking up. Actually, now that I think about it, Worf's role in Star Trek Insurrection isn't terrible either. It's not as good as in First Contact, but he gets his moments to shine, and they're not bad. The excuse for Worf being back on the Enterprise is a bit of an afterthought. Worf's just kind of there on the ship, and a line of dialogue establishes that he was at a colony nearby and decided to drop in for a visit. Not as smooth as his entrance at First Contact, but hey, it gets the job done, and the movie's not about why Worf is on the Enterprise anyway, so it's fine. Then, Worf joins Picard on his mission to round up Data, who is malfunctioning on the Baku planet, and gets a funny beat when he initially refuses to join Picard in a distracting Gilbert and Sullivan sing-along. 
Due to the anti-aging properties of the Baku planet, Worf re-enters puberty and develops a big old pimple on his nose. That's a little broad, but he also experiences a surge of adolescent aggression that comes out when he smashes an enemy probe on the surface with the butt of his phaser rifle, then turns excitedly to Picard and says, Definitely feeling aggressive tendency, sir. I love that bit. Insurrection doesn't give Worf as much meaningful business as First Contact, but it does a good job of giving him bits that allow him to be funny while still feeling like Worf, which I appreciate. While I'm on the subject of things I appreciate, let me talk about Star Trek Nemesis, because I enjoy abrupt reversals. Not only is Nemesis the worst Star Trek TNG movie, and the worst Star Trek movie, period, it's also the worst one for Worf. And that applies if you followed his character development on Deep Space Nine or not. Nemesis opened in theaters a few years following the end of Deep Space Nine. If you did follow Worf's character development on that series, you might be momentarily confused and or annoyed by the fact that Worf is not only apparently back as a full-time member of Picard's crew on the Enterprise, but even in Starfleet at all, since at the end of Deep Space Nine, Worf left Starfleet to become a Federation ambassador on the Klingon homeworld and work alongside his friend Martok, who was still settling into his new gig as Chancellor. Worf's abrupt return to Starfleet is addressed very briefly in a deleted scene, but it's not even mentioned in the final cut of the film. And here's the thing, if you watch my Star Trek videos even semi-regularly, you know that I care way more about the story I'm watching at the moment than I do about any discontinuity between that story and other stories set in the same world. If Star Trek Nemesis had been a good movie, or even if Worf's part in it had been good, I, as a devoted lover of Deep Space Nine, would have shrugged and said, whatever, Worf's back for some reason, let's just enjoy the movie. But Star Trek Nemesis isn't a good movie, or even an okay movie, it's a rotten movie. And like I said, even if you don't know about Worf's career change at the conclusion of Deep Space Nine, his contributions to Nemesis have a distinct why'd they even bother quality, which, to be fair, is shared by the rest of the movie. Let's see, what does Worf do in Nemesis? He gets drunk at Riker and Troy's wedding reception. He complains about having to be naked at the Betazoid ceremony. He rides in a dune buggy. He... Um... Admits the Romulans fought with honor against Shinzon, which I guess counts as character development, maybe. And he... Actually, that's pretty much it. Aside from working his station on the bridge and firing torpedoes and stuff like that. Again, the TNG movies in general are pretty bad about giving the supporting cast things to do. First Contact is the best at that, and Nemesis is definitely the worst. The script of Nemesis is so desperate to find something for Riker to do that they actually give him an extended fight scene when Worf is right there! They have a big hand-to-hand -hand fight in the last act of the movie, and Worf's not even in it? It's the last TNG movie. And every time I say that, there's always a few people in the comments like, well, it turned out to be the last TNG movie, but they didn't know that at the time, and they left room at the end where they could have done more if this one had been a hit and they wanted to keep the series going. Riker and Troy got married. They killed Data. It says a generation's final journey begins on the poster. They were planning on this being the last one, kids. It's the last TNG movie. And Worf doesn't even have a fight? Worf, the guy who fights, doesn't have a fight in the last movie? Riker, the guy who plays the trombone and sounds cool when he says fire and favors an atypical method of sitting in chairs, he gets the big fight? I love Riker. You know I love Riker. And that fight with the Viceroy sucks and drags on forever, and I don't believe for a second it would have been better if they swapped in Worf for Riker, but at least if they had, the right guy would have been in it. That shitty, tedious, time-killing fight scene should have been Worf's, goddammit! And you know what? This being the final film in a nod to TNG tradition, have Worf lose the fight. Worf fights the Viceroy, puts a beating on him, but ultimately the Viceroy gains the upper hand and is about to kill Worf, and then Riker shows up and blows the Viceroy away with a phaser. And then he walks over and extends his hand to Worf and helps him up, and the two of them get a nice little bro moment to remind us that they're supposed to be friends. Nope. 
Instead, Worf goes off-roading with Picard and Data, and then just... kind of hangs out for another hour and a half. I only have one thing to say to that. Good feck look. See, you can just make it up. Unfortunately, Klingons don't really play a major role in the Kelvin timeline films. The only time they have any presence to speak of is in Star Trek Into Darkness, when John Harrison, later revealed to be Kanunian Singh, escapes to the Klingon homeworld and Captain Kirk and the Enterprise are sent after him, ordered to carry out an extrajudicial execution using long-distance torpedoes. Kirk instead opts to take a small landing party down to the surface and capture Khan personally. They run into trouble in the form of a gang of Klingons. There's really not much to say about these Klingons, since they're really just in the movie to give Kirk and his people someone to fight for one scene. I like the character design of the alternate reality Klingons. The helmets give them an air of mystery and menace that their Prime Universe counterparts don't really have. And I dig the rings their unnamed leader wears in his forehead ridges, and the slightly more reptilian appearance. We don't see much of them, but these Kelvin Timeline Klingons make a compelling and threatening first impression. Then they fight the good guys and lose pretty much right away, so they're not so different from the Klingons in the original timeline after all. As I think you can see, the Star Trek movies have provided us with a diverse group of Klingons over the years. Growly, grumpy Klingons, scheming, screaming Klingons, brassy Klingons, sassy Klingons, young, old, and classy Klingons, busty and bedazzled Klingons, Klingons talking, Klingons balking, Klingons spacewalking, Klingons swimming, Klingons singing, Klingons walking down the hall, Klingons driving, Klingons arriving, Klingons not doing much at all. Yes, my friends, if you're looking for that added touch to give your movie that quintessential Star Trek feeling, I recommend Klingons. Just make sure it's a Star Trek movie, or else that might be confusing. And also, you could get in a lot of trouble. That'll about do it for me, folks. Remember, if you want to support this channel, you can do so by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash Steve Shives, becoming a channel member by clicking the join button, or by making a one-time gift by clicking the thanks button or via PayPal or Venmo. Links for those are in the description. If you can afford it and you think I'm worth it, I strongly encourage you to become a supporter at whatever level you're comfortable with, because I couldn't do this without my wonderful patrons and channel members and generous gift givers. And now, as the Klingons say, Kapla.